All right, sweet. So day three to the mix. Um, so at this point, we have processed individually all of our sounds. Then we have routed the groups of instruments. So really, we just kind of have a small ensemble here, but we have pairs of tracks um, with our cajon. We broke that apart to low and high. So we created a sum track for that. Essentially, we routed both of those cajon tracks to a cajon sum. We've routed the guitar one and two to a guitar sum. Mando, left and right, or you know, small diaphragm, large diaphragm, is routed to a uh, mandolin sum. Sum tracks are basically used to take a group of instruments, like you know, if it was a drum set or something, we would send all of the drum set instruments, all those tracks, to one auxiliary input track so that we can control the whole drum set with one fader or put a compressor on the whole drum set and we can also individually process all of the individual drum sounds because there's you know the ability to do that on the individual drum tracks so the the idea of routing things to some tracks helps us in the way that we can control the whole drum once the drums are balanced or once all of the mics on the guitar are balanced we can just control the volume of the guitar with one fader so when we're balancing and mixing, at the end of our process here, we'd be like, oh, too much drums, bring the drums down, okay. More guitar, cool, there goes guitar. More mandolin, you know, we just can use one fader to kind of adjust a huge, large group of instruments, um, which is gonna be really useful when we have like a drum set and five background vocals and four guitar tracks for, you know, the rhythm track and everything gets really complicated in some situations. It's way simpler or it's way simple to balance those instruments amongst themselves and then send them to a sum track that we can control all of those instruments with one fader. So we've created the sum tracks for that purpose, as well as a couple other auxiliary input tracks that we created for the purpose of short verb and long verb. So these are effects return tracks. Now there's a difference between the routing. When we routed things for the sum tracks, when we had like two cajones and two guitars and two mandolins. We routed using buses, using stereo buses, but from the outputs of the track, right? Because we want to route the entire signal, all of the signal from these tracks into that sum track. Now, when we do that with effects, we want to have the effect, like reverb, in parallel. So we used sends. So up here from the sends category, under the inserts, um, we're able to um, create bus sends that send a portion of that signal. So when we're mixing reverb into our, our session, we can add reverb, a little bit of reverb on every track and send that into the reverb return track. So it's two different types of things. We're routing via buses, always, but in the case of effects, in a return tracks, in effects returns, we use sends. When we're routing for the purpose of summing all the instruments together, we route them out of the outputs. We don't want to have like, you know, a guitar track in one place and then another guitar track in another place because that makes no sense. We might want to have a clean guitar track and then a reverb guitar track, but we don't want to have like guitar track, guitar track doubled up. It'd be confusing. We can't control the dynamics and balance that very well. So that's the main difference between routing out of the outputs, the total sound goes to this other location. When we route with sends, a portion of that sound is sent to another location, mainly like a return track. These are all auxiliary stereo, auxiliary input tracks that we use for sums or for effects returns. So we basically have set up this whole entire session um, to the point to where we can now start mixing. Okay, so we haven't done anything. Really, the faders are all kind of just sitting at unity at this point. And um, we've set up um, compressors and stuff and EQs, which we've done some work with, but we can also circle back around when we listen to the whole mix and adjust the tone if we want more bright or darkness, or, you know, highs and lows out of a sound, or we want more or less compression. We have those tools just sitting there wait, ready to go. Okay, so um, once I get to, the, uh, to this point with my mix, I have all the tools set out, I have my, my workbench all dialed in, all the things I need to do, you know, I have out for the job, um, and now it's time to kind of go and, and see what we got going on and get into it. 
So um, initially, I'm just going to like listen to the track um, and just kind of see what things sound like as is. And then I'm going to start kind of rebuilding the mix from the ground up. Um, well, sometimes I'll do that. Sometimes I'll build it around the voice. Okay, so here's the idea. What's the most important thing in a song? Like a song that has a singer. Not an instrumental band, but a, a, a group that has a, a recording that has a voice in it. What's the most important thing? I guess the lead vocal name. The voice is the most important thing. Yeah. There's a voice in a song, unless they're singing oohs and ahs and stuff, the voice is the most important thing. All the other instruments are known as accompaniment. The guitar is the is accompaniment. The drums is accompaniment. Like all that other stuff is is sort of you know um, in service of the voice. So because of that fact, a lot of times when I'm building a mix, I'll tear down all the faders and I'll just put the voice up and get a nice, good, strong voice level that's you know in the ballpark of like you know negative four or five dB on the meter, like a good strong signal with the voice. And then I'll go and I'll bring in the other instruments around it, okay? Now, if the voice is the number one, the number one important thing, and then we go to the band, to the, all the, you know, the um, supporting instruments, the rest of the instruments in the band, what's going to be the next important thing, possibly? Rhythm instruments? I would go with rhythm instruments. I would go with percussion, specifically. So one way of approaching this, and there's a lot of you know, methodologies and theories about this, but for me, I'd like to get the voice up. I'm like, okay, my voice is pretty strong. Okay, I'm not saying it's strong, but you know, the voice is loud and it's EQ'd properly and it's compressed properly. I like the tone, I like what it's doing. I'm gonna bring in the drum kit and kind of find a nice happy spot for that drum to exist. You know, like in the drum and the voice are kind of working together. And then I'm going to bring in the bass, kind of fill in the swimming pool. Here comes the, the bass player now. I'm going to balance the drums and the bass together and make sure that's working good with the voice still. Okay, cool. Then I'm going to bring in, fill in some more of the pool, put some more water in it, bring more people into the party. And I'm going to bring in the chordal instruments, okay, maybe the guitar. Balance that with it. Okay, cool. Bass is solid, the kick drum and snares kick in. Like I can, I can feel the beat. I'm still feeling the dance. You know, I, I'm... I'm Feeling the pulse and everything's popping. The voice still sounds very clear. The chords are accompanying that harmony and stuff. Then I bring in some of the other, you know, accompaniment instruments, maybe the banjo and the and the mandolin, and then kind of find where those can kind of exist. And then I might pan those in a way that kind of like makes space for the voice to be in the middle and separate the guitar and the mandolin. And I got the guitars already pretty wide mixed at this point because I pan them hard left and right as well as put some uh, phasing going on so they sound wide. Then I'll just start placing things in the space and balancing them dynamically and balancing them um, as far as positioning them left and right. And then once I have everything working really good and I'm happy with the positioning panning wise as well as the dynamic balance of things, then I'll start deciding if I want to put things further back and, f and closer, right? Do I want my voice to be way up front? Do I want my voice to be a little bit further back? Do I want the mandolin or the banjo to be further back than the drums? Like, how do I position this stuff? And I'm going to use the reverb sends in adjusting those to kind of position things close and far away. So that's the theory. That's, that's my methodology. And let's, let's maybe try that and see what's going on. So first of all, I might just hit play and see what everything sounds like just raw, you know, just, just going out of the box here. Okay, so everything's way off balance, obviously. Um, I hear cajon and pretty much nothing else. Um, it sounds like the cajon player is sitting right in front of me and the rest of the band is way back in the, the back of the room, right? So already I have some sort of like, you know, vicinity, like depth understanding of my mix based on how loud things are. So depth, I control depth of instruments and I place them in a space deep and close based on two different things. I already mentioned one, right? Reverb can put things further back and make things closer. 
What else can make things feel closer and farther away? Volume. Volume. Yeah. If I have the drums turned way, way up, it's going to sound like the drums right in front of my face, and all the other quieter instruments are kind of in the background. So I can use dynamics and reverb to kind of place things in the space, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm kind of hearing like it feels like the drummer's in my face because the drums are just super loud. So let's go to our mix view here with all my all of our faders, and um, I have the cajon on a sum track right here. I'm going to listen to the cajon first and balance the kick and the snare part of the cajon. Because I, I messed with that earlier. I was kind of like, you know, doing that quiz for you guys. So I put these things out of whack. I want to balance the cajon, kick, and snare sound just for a second before I mix the cajon into something. I want to make sure the cajon tracks themselves are balanced amongst themselves. So I'm going to do that first. I'm okay with that. Awesome. So I'm going to turn the cajon track all the way down. Um, I think my guitars are pretty balanced, but let's just double check. I'm going to solo both of my guitar tracks, and I'm going to listen to them and make sure that I have equal volume coming out of the left and right speaker, and I don't have any weird things happening as far as the balance of left and right. Because when you pan something hard left and right, you really got to be careful about one being louder than the other. You want to make sure, like with headphones or sitting in front of your speakers, that the left and right channels are pretty well balanced. So I'm going to do that with headphones here and just double check and make sure my guitars are balanced left and right with each other. Okay, seems like they're pretty balanced. Um, everything else is not really um, being separated or panned. My, my small diaphragm and large diaphragm mandolin might be something I would balance tonally. Because I have a small diaphragm mic on the mandolin's 12th fret, when, if you remember recording this. Um, well, I'll just, actually we didn't, we put one mic on the mandolin. But just know that when I recorded it at home, I put a small diaphragm on the 12th fret, which captures a lot of the high frequencies. And then I put a, a large diaphragm on the body of the mandolin, two mics in stereo, that captures more of the, the, the lower end of the mandolin. So depending on your, your taste of mandolin tone, if you want it to be more bright or dark or whatever, I'm going to listen to that mandolin for a second. I'm just going to kind of balance the low and the high aspects of the mandolin and just kind of make sure I'm happy with the tone of it. Whoa. Okay, so um, I kind of felt like I wanted a little bit more of the high small diaphragm of the mandolin than the low. I can bring that low end to the side of it. I can kind of mix it in along with it um, if I want more body to the mandolin. But I like the brighter end of the mandolin, and that's kind of like what the mandolin does. It's a very high frequency instrument. So I'm going to leave the high part of the mandolin up, and I'm going to kind of like bring this into taste. Now, the mandolin, if you notice, has no inserts on it. There's no EQ, there's no compression, okay? And the reason I left that out was because I liked how the mandolin sounded kind of raw without any things on the individual mics. And I really wanted to EQ and compress those two um, mics together. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over to my mandolin sum track 
and I'm going to put an EQ and a compressor on the mandolin sum track because I basically wanted to, you know, do some light compression and some, some maybe some subtle EQ if I needed to, but I'm going to do it on the mandolin mics as a pair, like together as a group. I'm not trying to do it separately because those two mics have their own characteristic sound and I was happy with both of those. And um, so I'm going to throw my EQ on there just, and I'm not going to touch it. I'm just going to put it on there in case I need to do some EQing down the road, but I'm going to engage my compressor and get some light compression on the mandolin just to enhance the, the sound a little bit. So like you do when you use a compressor, you throw it on, you solo the track, you hit play, and then you start to turn up the input so you can get some attenuation. Okay, now I'm getting some attenuation, that needle's bouncing around. I might speed my release time up. Okay, so I'm just going to do some very, very subtle, um, very subtle compression. Like I said, a lot of times I'll put compression on everything just because compressors color the sound a little bit. And if I ever need to gain something up or I want a little bit more articulation, I can circle back around and like use that compressor a little bit more. But if you have the ability to throw on an 1176 compressor on all of your channels, if you had like rack mounted 1176 compressors for days, <laughs> you would probably use them on every instrument because they sound awesome. They enhance the sound, they add a little bit of color and some subtle compression can really kind of just bring a sound and make it kind of like, you know, pop out of the speakers. So because we're digital and we can throw on plugins that model analog pieces of gear that are awesome, I a lot of times will use something like that on every track just because it gives a little bit of color to it. And um, yeah, so I did that to the mandolin. And uh, I think that was the last thing I wanted to do to the mandolin. So mandolin's good. I'm going to move on here and... Uh, Let's go into the balancing phase. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tear down all of the faders. I'm gonna tear down my, my cajon, I'm gonna tear down, and these are the, um, a lot of these are the sums I'm talking about. I'm gonna tear down the guitar sum, I'm gonna turn down the mandolin sum, I'm gonna lead, well, I'm gonna bring my, vo my Vox Harmony sum track down as well. Okay, um, so, over here I have the banjo and the bass. These two tracks, um, I did not create sends, or I'm, I didn't create sums for. They're just by, the, by their lonesome. So I'm gonna have to turn the bass down, I'm gonna have to turn the, man, the banjo down too. And the dobro, forgot about the dobro. Um, so basically I've turned down all the sounds, all the instruments, except for the voice, okay? So I'm gonna find like a chunk of this song, maybe like, uh, maybe the chorus. I'll just kind of go into the chorus here and uh, I'm gonna loop the chorus. At least maybe one of the phrases of the chorus here. And uh, I'm gonna use this to kind of balance the band because this is when everyone's kind of like, you know, playing loudly and everyone's in essentially doing their thing um, on the chorus. So, I'm gonna go ahead and play that, loop that. I'm asleep at the end of the bar. The, I'm asleep. And the first thing I'm gonna bring up is the cajon and balance that with the voice. I'm asleep at the end of the bar. I'm asleep at the end of the bar. Now I'm gonna grab the bass and bring the bass in. Then I'm going to bring in the guitar. Now I'm going to bring in the banjo.
Okay, and then I'm gonna bring in the mandolin. Okay, so first of all, panning wise, I'm ready to start making some moves with panning. I've brought in kind of like most of the instruments that are rhythmically active. The dobro is kind of doing some <coughs> color, like some melodic stuff. So it's kind of, it's got a different role. I'm thinking about the roles of the instruments. The voice is the lead. Um, other instruments take lead at certain times, like during solos. Um, the dobro is kind of really mainly functioning, if I remember what you were playing, mainly doing like, you know, melodic counterpoint type of stuff. Maybe some chord chunking stuff. But um, the mandolin and the banjo, a lot of times, are kind of doing like a rhythmic thing just like the guitar is doing. Now, I don't want everything in the center, okay? The main things I want to be panned in the center are going to be the voice, always. If it's singing the lead, it's going to be in the dead center. The drums, the kick and the snare is always going to be dead center. The bass is always going to be dead center. And everything else, I try to spread apart. So, mandolin and banjo, I'm thinking could go left and right. Somewhere in the middle. Not hard left and right, but I'm thinking like, you know, split the difference. Um, because the guitars are hard left and right. And I want the banjo mandolin to be kind of apart from that. So I'm going to go left with the banjo about 37. And then on the mandolin sum. Oh. I'm going to actually I'm going to do it on the mandolin uh, individual mandolin tracks here. Because I don't have a consistent way of panning with these stereo um, left and right panning knobs on the sum. So what I usually do if, if I have two instruments that are being routed, I'm going to route, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, pan both of these equally. So like maybe 29 on both of these uh, mandolins. Actually, what did I do the banjo? Banjo is at, banjo is at 37. So I'm going to go 37 with both of the mandolins to the right though. I'm going to panning them both right 37. And that's just like a degrees, I, I think. So. Okay, this is close. There we go, 37, 37. All right, so now I'm going to listen to it and just see how those instruments are sitting apart from each other, panning-wise. Okay. So I like the positioning. Now I'm going to bring the dobro in and see what the dobro is doing. Okay. So the dobro could be left or right. Um, I might decide on base on where to put the dobro based on what it's doing in respect to the banjo and the mandolin okay so i'm going to look over here at my waveforms and i'm going to see here's my dobro my dobro track and uh when the mandolin is chunking the dobro is Let's see what the dobro does while the mandolin's chunking and while the banjo's chunking. Because if there's a different function as far as what the banjo and the mandolin are doing, I might put them on the same side or on opposite sides. It's tough to say. I don't want to put it right on top of the voice, but maybe to the left or right of the voice subtly. Okay, so I'm going to kind of play with this. You guys do this. This is personal preference kind of stuff. But I'm going to try putting the dobro on either the left or the right side and kind of just play with that and see where it sits best um, in, res you know, in respect to the, man the banjo and the mandolin. So it's usually like if you have like an even, even number of instruments, you can sometimes pan everything sort of like, you know, in, in, you know if there's four instruments, 
you can have two in the middle or two on left and right one in left and right like a guitar hard left and right stereo and then you can do like a banjo here and a mandolin here and the voice in the middle but we have this third instrument that has to fit in there somewhere so you have to kind of make a decision do you want it to sit on the right side does it work better on the left side you kind of like you know you have to play with it a little bit so i'm gonna listen with my headphones and try to make a decision and see what i like as far as its placement goes I think I like it on the left side with the banjo because timbrely, I feel like there's a better match between the dobro's tone and the banjo's tone. They're both very like thin nasally. They're a lot of like 4K, you know, just mid, high mids and, and upper frequencies where the, the mandolin kind of has more of, has some of that sparkly super high stuff but also has some body to it. So I almost feel like it matches, it plays better with the banjo. So I'm going to put it on the banjo side. Maybe you feel the same, maybe you feel different. Um, but uh, that's kind of what I'm doing on a quick decision here. Okay, cool. So um, the next thing is to bring in the vocal harmonies and see how those sit alongside the vocal track. Um, they're kind of the icing on the cake, the oohs, nahs, and then the harmonies on the chorus. If you're looking at the, the waveforms, you can see that these vocal harmony tracks basically come in. There's one harmony that, that layers on top of the um, on on top of the voice when we uh, when we're singing that um, that hook, like the I'm asleep thing. That's going to be harmonized with the other voice, and then there's these oohs and ahs that happen um, towards the end of that chorus. So symmetrically, I'm trying to decide like, what do I want to do here? It's like, it would be kind of weird to have the harmony be only on the left side, right? Wouldn't that be weird if there was like a vocal harmony that just like popped out of nowhere on the left speaker, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So I could just leave it pan center, but also have these oohs, these two, Oohs, this, the, these are kind of just singing like harmonized notes here on those oohs. And I definitely have, I have two of them, so I definitely want to have those kind of left and right speaker. So what I could do, I could do a couple things. I could turn on my automation for panning. So if you go to the waveform track, part of the track here, the track view selector, where it says waveform, I can choose pan. And what I can do is I can like highlight a portion of the waveform and I can pan it, automate the panning to be left or right and leave it center. You mean like one one going on the left speaker, one on the right speaker? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. So if I like because I have the two oohs, I can have left, this one on the left, and then the other one on right speaker. Okay. Um but what I'm trying to decide is decide here is if I want to have these um centered or or I could duplicate this waveform put it down here and then just pan everything left and right and I would just have two versions of that harmony on either side and I could put them out of phase a little bit so they sound like you know kind of phasey and wide that might be kind of cool because it, essentially these two tracks are separate takes like I sang one note here I sang another note here so there's going to be like phasing and just like discrepancies in the timing of these oohs and they're going to be panned hard left and right and it's going to sound really cool and wide but I could kind of recreate some of that with this by duplicating that piece of audio down to the other track and then putting it slightly out of phase and then panning it just like I would so I'm going to try that first couple options here we'll see what sounds best I mean this is kind of the the nature of mixing as you you know, kind of come up with theories and ideas and then you test them out and see what sounds the best and you go with what you think sounds best. A lot of that's kind of subjective, but um, some of it's not. So to do this copy and paste thing, 
because essentially I got to copy this and this to the other track. So this section with those harmonies and then this section right here, at least the first part of that section, I'm going to copy up to the next track. So to do that really cleanly, I want to turn on my grid. So um, you see you have the slip, spot, shuffle, and then grid mode over here. I'm going to engage the grid mode. I'm going to go down to one of my vocal tracks here. I'm going to trim it so that it has a, a, a clean start. So I use that trim tool to trim it so that it's right on the line. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to select that portion of the audio. Um, Command C to copy. Then I'm going to click up here on that other vocal harmony track and I'm going to paste it. So now I have duplicated that piece of the audio. I'm going to do the same thing over here. When I zoom in, I realize, oh, I could trim that a little bit and get that to start right on the note or I mean, right on a, you know, a grid line. So it's a super clean copy. Control C and then, I'm sorry, Command C and then Command V to paste that. So now I have kind of a duplicate of that harmony part. Now the next thing I want to do, like I said, I want to put it out of phase a little bit. Um, and I also want to pan it left and right. So maybe we pan left and right first. So um, I'm going to go back to my um, mix view. And I can see that I have my vocal lead, which is dead center. And then I have my vocal harmonies, which I'm going to now label. I think I might change the labeling of these and go left and right or something. So I could double click and I could go vocal harm left. And then ne the next one could be vocal harm right so I don't get confused. And then I'll pan those kind of hard left and right. I'm going to go about 47 pan to the, you know, 47 degrees left and right with those harmonies. Okay. Next step, I'm going to turn off my grid mode. I'm going to turn it to slip mode. I just went back to my edit view and I turn my computer into, or my, my Pro Tools uh, edit window into slip mode. And I'm going to zoom way in to this waveform here. And I'm going to just put it slightly out of phase. I'm just going to pull one of those tracks slightly ahead of the other one so that there's some phase. And I'm going to listen to it and see what it sounds like. Oh, actually, I got to turn it up first, right? Mm -hmm. So where's my vocal harmonies here. I might solo those too. A good way to do this is maybe just solo the vocal track as well as the vocal harmonies. And that'll give me an, a very accurate idea of what it sounds like in balance with the, uh, with the voice. Okay, that works pretty darn good. It's a little loud, but let me duck it down a bit. Ooh, I like that. I'm going to go to my ooze and see what the ooze sound like. Okay, that's kind of neat. Uh, I need to go to the other section of audio here on the second chorus. And I'm going to put these slightly out of phase as well to get some of that phasing, which I like. Okay, it's out of phase. Boom. I like that. Okay, cool. And also, yeah, I actually that's, that's all I need to do. All right, cool. So I'm going to put it back in with the rest of the mix, and I'm going to listen to my chorus with all the instruments and get an idea of how my, my harmonies sound now mixed in with the rest of the band and everything. So when I throw the rest of the band and the vocal harmonies aren't that present. They're kind of buried a little bit. So I could turn up my vocal harmonies a little bit, which I might, but I also might just compress the vocal harmony sum track. So really glue those things together, maybe boost the articulation, just really enhance them a little bit. Um, 
before I just crank the fader up. So on my vocal harmony track, I'm going to go ahead and throw on another BF76 and um, hit play somewhere where there's actually audio. <coughs> And maybe crank the output up a little bit. There we go. So I can kind of make those present a little bit more present by compressing them. Rather than just like turning up the fader, I can throw a compressor on it, which glues them together, probably enhances the articulation, just gives some juice. It really just juices the sound. And then I have the fader there to come up a little bit too. Okay, cool. So, at this point, we're going to listen. You guys are going to listen to the tracks, listen to the balance of the instruments, listen to your panning, kind of make those decisions that I was making already, and kind of do your own touch with it. And then, if you realize that some of these instruments sound a little too thin, like the guitar is too thin, which I kind of felt like the guitar was a little thin, maybe I can beef up the guitar by letting out some of that high-pass filter. Um, in, in bringing in more of the low parts of the guitar, or maybe more of the low parts of the dobro, or whatever I did to trim the, the, the low frequencies off a lot of that, a lot of the instruments, I might have been a little bit more aggressive, or too much aggressive, and now that I feel like it's too thin, I can make those subtle adjustments with just letting a high pass or low pass filter out a little bit to kind of fatten up any of these instruments because they're not as big as they, they need to be. Then I go through and I start adding some reverb to the sounds. I might start with individual things like the voice. You know, so I might pull up the vocal tracks and solo the lead voice and then start creating the space I want for the voice, the type of reverb sound I want. Now we're out there in the cold asking ourselves why I'm asleep at the end of the bar so take my keys, I won't get too far. Okay, do the same thing with these harmonies. Add some verb to them. I can also pan my verbs. You see how the reverbs have pans on them? That's another thing you can do. If you want those, those vocal tracks that are panned left and right to have reverb, that's kind of reflecting the left and right. I can do the same thing with my panning of the, um, the reverb sends. I can set those suckers to be left and right and then the reverb will be kind of like trailing off out of the speakers. So the vocal tracks are panned at like um, 47 degrees, and then I have like the super hard pan of the reverb, and all of a sudden those things are shooting out the sides of the speakers, and the reverb's just kind of like going out, you know? So I can make reverb kind of travel a certain direction too by panning it. That reflects or maybe does the opposite of what my instruments are pan like. So I have that ability. Now we're out there in the cold Asking ourselves why I'm asleep at the end of the bar Okay, my reverb might be a little too long in that long verb. If you're feeling like that reverb's too much like a church in a cave, I can dial my room size down a little bit. I can adjust the reverb parameters specifically on the reverb plugin to kind of get the reverb tuned in the way you want it and that's definitely part of this process we didn't nail it the first time you never do but when you get in the ballpark and then when you circle back around you hear the music in the context you're like oh that reverb's a little too much or that that room small room reverb's not the right tone it's a little bit too bright and you can kind of dial these things in now that you hear the song in context and you spend more time with it um, all these tools are just sitting on the tool the tool table ready for you to like grab them and make the fixes and do the adjustments you need to do as you go through this mixing process and decide where things are going to sit spatially, how much verb needs to be on this and that, the subtle EQ corrections that you might make that are subjective and you know kind of unique to your opinion of what an acoustic band should be should sound like and what these instruments should be should sound like tonally and spatially and how much reverb's on them. So a lot of that is subjective, and that's what I'm leaving up to you guys to do now. Like, I kind of gave you the tools and told you my theory, my methodology, and, and constructed the session and built it. Now you guys kind of take the time to kind of fine-tune it and get it to be what you want it to be. And I'm going to do the same thing right now 
but I'm not, I'm not going to really explain it. I'm just going to do it. But I kind of give you guys the, the insight and set the tools out on the table. Now go and fix it and do the job. Okay? So you should be in the ballpark of having a pretty damn good mix right now. So you just need to kind of sprinkle in the verb, balance these things out, do some subtle EQ corrections and whatever else you want to do. And um, that'll be the end of uh, our lecture and our, pract or our lesson on mixing an acoustic band. Projects basically, yeah, you turn this thing, you're going to bounce it. Maybe I talk about bouncing, how to bounce this. You guys have bounced things before, but essentially what you're going to do is you're going to, when you get ready, when you're done with this, you're going to find kind of the, the beginning and the end regions of your audio. Maybe put a little fade on the beginning of these tracks if you want to. Maybe trim off some of the dead air, like there's dead air over here before the dobro comes in. You know, just do some cleaning of the edges of the tracks, removing space. You know, if there's any like dead air between vocal takes, you know, mouth noises and things that happen in between these spaces, you can do some editing and clean some of that stuff up. Like, look at this open mic right here. The mic was open the whole time. I just sat around in my bedroom with the mic running this whole entire time in between the verse and chorus. So, you might get in there and just clean that up, put a little fade on the edges there. You know, eliminate some of the space, the dead air on dead mics. Um, you could do some of that, you know. Um, decide when the, the track is over. You want it to end right there. You might set your whole entire track region to be starting from this point. And then going forward. Or maybe it needs to be a little bit closer. When you hit the play button, you want it to fire off right away. There you go. Another thing you can do in this part of the process is do some volume automation. I didn't even talk about that. So when the solos happen, when the mandolin takes a solo and the, and the dobro takes a solo, you might do some automation to bring the mandolin up or the banjo up for its solo. You might automate the panning too. I might automate to have the banjo or the, the mandolin during the mandolin solo go front and center. There's no voice, and there's nothing in the middle. Banjo or the mandolin steps in the middle of the, the, the room and plays a solo. The dobro does the same thing, and then I pan it back to its original um, um, orientation afterwards. Okay? Do you guys know how to do automation with panning and volume? Right? That's another thing you'll do as you listen to the song if you really want to get detailed is balance amongst the instruments within sections of the song. When a solo happens or someone changes from rhythm to lead, you might want that instrument to be a little bit tucked down, a little bit more up in the mix, orientated in the center if it's soloing, orientated in the left or right if it's if it's playing rhythmic. You're gonna do that with volume and panning automation. Okay? There's another subjective thing that I'm explaining to you that I want you to do. And that's something I would be doing too. Alright? Cool. Um, yeah, so Let's just see how you guys do with this. Um, I'll stop the instruction there. You know how to balance. You know how to do automation. You can spend a lot more time mixing this and getting it super dialed. Or, uh, yeah. So bounce this thing. You're going to turn it in, uh, turn it into me as an MP3. And if we read the um, description of the project, just to double check, um, I believe there is a write-up. Is that correct? Yep, Project 3 Acoustic Reflection Paper. So basically, um, write up a little reflection on the, yeah, your take on, in your own words, the, the recording session and some tidbits about your mixing, what you kind of did unique to your thing. Because we all kind of did the same basic setup. You don't have to like, go no you know move by move and everything we did because we did it a lot as a as a group but like the subtle things that you did that were kind of extra the stuff that you continue to kind of do within your own mixing practice at this point on i want you to include some of that in your discussion uh, on the reflection paper so the reflection paper is really just talking about the session what you remember about these instruments and how we mic'd them and the issues we had and then your your kind of custom specific things you did to the mix and why you did it um and then turn in that with the bounce, MP3 bounce of the song. And uh, we'll listen to them in class and uh, kind of give some feedback and see how people did with, with the mix. 
and how they're unique and different and what we liked and what we didn't like kind of thing. All the subjective yet objective stuff as well. Sound good? Any questions beyond about any of that stuff? Okay, cool. Well, happy mix and I look forward to hearing what you guys do with this. I'm going to do a little bit more with it myself um, and uh, we'll compare um, mixes and notes. Yes? Uh, do you Monday then? That's, or I believe, what that what the due date is on this, right? Let's double check. Project three, mix day, project three, mix of day. Oh, maybe it's in the uh, content here. It's writing notes, reflection paper. Ten eight. I guess that was today. <laughs> so yeah, we're gonna have this due Monday. It'll be due Monday.